Welcome back, my friends. We're going to troubleshoot inter-office connectivity. As always, we're trying to simulate the exam. So for each problem, we'll read the trouble ticket and look at the topology diagrams as needed. Ticket number six. Ensure that EIGRP internal and external and OSPF intra-area and inter-area routes appear in R3's IP routing table. Do not remove any access control list or access control entries. And do not log into R1, R2, or R4. All right, let's go ahead and jump on over to R3. Here we are on R3. Let's go ahead and see if we have any IPv6 routes. Show IPv6 route. And let's scroll down here a little bit. And there are, in fact, no OSPF or EIGRP routes. Okay. Well, let's start with EIGRP since it is a link state protocol and that's going to make it a little bit simpler for us. So let's just do a show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor to see if we have any adjacencies and we have no neighbors. All right. Now the layer three and layer two topology diagrams show that we should have two adjacencies on gig 05, which is R5, and gig 06, which is R6. So let's take a look at our EIGRP interface configuration. Show IPv6 EIGRP interfaces. And we see that EIGRP is enabled on gig 05 and 06. Now, rather than going to R5 and R6, let's first check and see if we have IPv6 reachability to those neighbors via their global unicast addresses. We'll do a ping. 36 double colon 6 and a timeout of 1 and looks like that is in fact failing. All right, let's try 35 double colon 5 with a timeout of 1. This is R5 and we're getting no response from it as well. So let's go ahead and check the IPv6 neighbor table. Show IPv6 neighbors. And we have neighbor discovery entries for R5 and R6's global unicast addresses and their link local addresses. All right. Well, let's go ahead and try pinging the link local addresses. We'll do ping FE80, double colon 5, timeout of 1, and we'll repeat only twice so that we're not waiting. Gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 5 is the outgoing interface. And we get no response there. Okay, now let's try FE80 double colon 6, timeout of 1, and repeat twice. And the outgoing interface here, gigabit Ethernet 06, and you do have to type out the full interface name. No response there as well. So what we know so far is neighbor discovery is in fact working, but nothing else seems to be working. Okay, let's do a show IPv6 traffic to see if we can get any clues and we'll scroll down a little bit more and notice where it says unreachable and the number of admin unreachables is 2,445. Now what this tells us is we're seeing IPv6 traffic filtering. We've got an access list somewhere that's blocking some traffic. Let's see if we can figure out what exactly that access list is. We'll do a show IPv6 interface and include is up or access and looks like gig 05 and gig 06 have an inbound ACL named paranoia and notice also that gig 03, 010 and 013 have it as well. Let's take a look at what this access list actually does. Show access list paranoia and it has one entry that blocks ff00 double colon slash 8 which you should recognize as the multicast range for IPv6. Now, the ticket said that we cannot remove any access control lists or entries. So we can't remove this, but perhaps we don't need to. Would blocking IPv6 multicast actually cause those pings to fail? Well, it really shouldn't. So is the access list actually a problem here? Well, remember, every access list has an implicit deny entry at the end, which denies all IPv6 traffic. Now, that would definitely cause our pings to fail. 
So what we can do is we can overcome that implicit deny by adding an entry to permit all IPv6 traffic. Let's go ahead and try it. Configure terminal, IPv6 access list paranoia, permit IPv6 any any. And right away we have some EIGRP adjacencies come up. Let's go ahead and check those routes. Show IPv6 route EIGRP. And now it looks like we have numerous internal EIGRP routes and one external route. So this is good. We're halfway there, but now we need to make sure OSPF inter and intra area routes show up as well. So let's check our OSPF adjacencies. Show IPv6 OSPF neighbor, and we've got no adjacencies, okay? Let's check the OSPF interface configuration. Show IPv6 OSPF interface brief, and it is enabled on gig 013, which is R2, gig 010, which faces R4, and gig 03, which faces R1, and all of those are in area 0, which is correct according to the layer 3 topology diagram. Now, what has to happen for OSPF neighbors to form an adjacency? Well, for starters, they need matching timers. Notice that the link type is point to multipoint, P2MP, for all of the physical interfaces. Now, we cannot log into R1, R2, or R4 to see how the link types are set up on those routers, but we can find out by using a debug. So let's do a debug IPv6 OSPF. Hello? And then we'll go ahead and turn off the debugs here. Now, what we see is we've got some mismatched hello parameters here, specifically hello timers. Look where it says dead R40C120 followed by hello R10C30. This is pretty cryptic, but the C is this router. R3. So what this means is that R3 has a hello interval of 30 seconds and a dead timer of 120 seconds. R is the other end and it shows a hello interval of 10 seconds and a dead timer of 40 seconds. And that is the same for all of those adjacent routers. Now this hello and dead interval combination, a hello interval of 10 seconds, dead timer of 40 seconds, that corresponds to the default timers for both the broadcast and the point-to-point -point OSPF network types. We're not sure which it is, but we do know that based on the topology diagrams, the links between R3 and its OSPF neighbors look like point-to-point -point links. So let's go ahead and set these links to the point-to-point -point network type. Configure terminal, interface range, gig 03, gig 010, and gig 013. Make sure I have a comma there instead of a period. And we'll do IPv6 OSPF network point to point, not point to multipoint, but point to point. And notice we get a potential network type mismatch error from R1. Now, nevertheless, the adjacency with it comes up as well as the other two. So let's see if we have any routes now. We'll do a do show IPv6 route OSPF. And we still get no routes. Okay, let's take a look at the link state database, specifically the router LSAs that R3 is generating. We'll do a show IPv6 OSPF dat router, and we want to see only the ones coming from R3. Now notice that the connection here to R2 is described as a point-to-point -point link here in this LSA. That's how R3 sees it. Now, let's see if R2 agrees that this is actually a point-to-point -point link. Now, first thing, we're going to get the type 8 LSA. We'll do a do show IPv6 OSPF dat link for the link type, and the advertising router is going to be 2222. And we've got one link facing R3, and you can tell that by the prefix address of 23 double colon slash 64. Now, look at the link state ID here. It's 15. Now, let's go ahead and do a show IPv6 OSPF dat router advertise to 222. Look at the router LSAs. And now look at the link with the matching link state ID of 15. 
R2 considers this a transit network, not a point-to-point -point link. Okay, so R2 and R3 disagree about what this link type is. Now, check this out. LSA ignored an SPF calculation. R3 is ignoring this router LSA because of the mismatch. And if it ignores R2's router LSA, that means it has no way to get to R2, and hence, it won't install any routes Learn from R2. So, the fix here is to change the OSPF network type to broadcast. Let's go ahead and do that. We're actually already in interface configuration mode, so we'll just do an IPv6 OSPF network broadcast. Our adjacencies drop, and then they come back up. So we have full adjacencies with one, two, and four. So let's go ahead and check the routing table again. Do show IPv6 route OSPF, not router, OSPF. And now we have both OSPF inter and intra area routes. Beautiful. So guess what? This ticket is solved. Let's move on to the next one. Next up is ticket number seven. Let's take a look at ticket number seven. R4 can't reach R0's 11 double colon 11 slash 128 loopback address. Ensure that R4 can ping this address. Well, sounds like a pretty simple, straightforward ticket. Let's go ahead onto R4 and see if we, in fact, cannot ping that address. Before we try to ping it, let's go ahead and just check the IPv6 routing table. Show IPv6 route 11 double colon 11 and the route is not found. Okay, so obviously we're not going to be able to ping it if we don't have a route to it. So let's go ahead and do a show IPv6 OSPF route to see what we do have here. And looks like that particular prefix, 11 double colon 11, is not here either. Last but not least, let's check the OSPF link state database, show IPv6 OSPF dat prefix, and we'll include 11 double colon, and nothing. Okay, so now let's go ahead and check our OSPF and EIGRP adjacencies. Show IPv6 OSPF neighbor, and we've got adjacencies with R1, R2, and R3, and that does match what's on the layer three topology diagram, okay? What about EIGRP? Let's go ahead and do a show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor. Make sure we have the space in there. We've got only one adjacency with R5. Okay, let's go ahead and check the topology table. Show IPv6 EIGRP topology, 11 double colon 11 slash 128. And that prefix is not there. So the prefix does not appear to be in the OSPF link state database, nor is R4 learning it from EIGRP. Now because R0 should be the source of this prefix, let's go ahead and jump to R0. From here, let's do a show IPv6 OSPF dat prefix, and let's take a look at the self-originating prefixes. Now the very first LSA here shows the prefix in area 20. Now a couple of things may jump out at you here. First, look at the advertising router. It's 3333, which is actually R3's router ID. But this LSA is generated by R0. So that tells us that R0 is using R3's router ID. Now, the only reason we know that is because we actually saw that router ID in the last ticket. But let's pretend that we don't know that. Does anything else jump out at you? Well, look at the layer three diagram. R0's interfaces facing R1 and R2 are in area 112. R0's loopback is in area 20. Now remember, in OSPF, you cannot have a non-zero area connected to another non-zero areas. All areas have to be connected to the backbone area zero unless you configure a virtual link. So let's check and see if we have a virtual link. We'll do a show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. And indeed, we have a virtual link connected to R1. So assuming the virtual link's configured correctly, that should not be an issue. Let's go ahead and jump over to R1 now. We'll do a show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. And we do have a virtual link adjacency with 3333, which as we just saw is actually R0. Now here's how we know that. 
we also have adjacencies with 3333 on gig 03, which we know faces R3, and gig 01, which faces R0. So clearly we have duplicate router IDs, and R0 is using R3's router ID. Okay, so now that we know that, let's jump back over to R0 and change the router ID to something unique. Let's go ahead and take a look at the OSPF running configuration to see exactly where that router ID is set. IPv6 router, and there it is, router ID 3333. Let's go ahead and change this to all 11s. We'll do configure terminal, IPv6 router OSPF1, router ID 11.11.11.11, and now we need to clear the OSPF process. So we'll do a do clear IPv6 OSPF process and confirm that we do want to do this. Yes. And notice it says to reconfigure virtual link neighbors with our new router ID. Well, that neighbor would be R1. So let's jump back over to R1 and reconfigure that virtual link. Let's do a show run section IPv6 router. Remember that when you configure a virtual link, you must specify the router ID of the virtual link neighbor. Here, it's configured as 3333, but we just changed the RID on R0 to 11, 11, 11, 11. So we need to reconfigure this. Now, it's going to get a little messy here because it's going to keep spitting out output at us. So I'm going to try to type fast. IPv6 router OSPF1 and then area 112 virtual link 11.11.11.11. I'm going to hit enter here. And area 112 is the transit area. It's the area that we're crossing over to get to area 20. All right, the virtual link is up now. Let's go ahead and check for the route now. Do show IPv6 route 11 double colon 11. And there it is. All right, now to solve the ticket, we need to make sure that R4 can actually ping this prefix. So back to R4 we go. Show IPv6 route 11 double colon 11. And there it is via R1. Let's try to ping it, ping 11 double colon 11. And yes, that works. And with that, we've solved ticket number seven. Okay, three more tickets to go in this module. Let's tackle ticket number eight. Ensure R0 can reach R8's 8 double colon 8 slash 128 loopback address. All right, another pretty simple sounding ticket. Let's jump on over to R0. First of all, let's check whether R0 actually has a route to that prefix. Show IPv6 route 8 double colon 8, and it has no route. Now that 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix should be coming from R8, which according to the layer 3 diagram is an EIGRP AS1337. So it would likely be redistributed into OSPF as a type 5 external LSA. Let's see if we have one of those. Show IPv6 OSPF dat external and nothing, not a single external LSA. So this is a clue that redistribution may be broken. Of course, it's also possible R8 just isn't advertising the prefix at all. But let's just check and see which routers are the ASBRs, the AS boundary routers. Show IPv6 OSPF border routers. And we have R4, R2, and R3 listed as ASBRs. But if you look at the layer 3 diagram, it looks like R3 and R4 are the only ones that should be redistributing routes from EIGRP. So perhaps R2 is redistributing a connected route or something like that. Regardless, let's start with R3 and see if it has that prefix. We'll jump over to R3 and let's do a show IPv6 route, 8 double colon 8. And there it is via R6, but it does not appear to be getting redistributed. So let's go ahead and check and see how redistribution is configured, if it is in fact configured at all. Show IPv6 protocols, section OSPF or EIGRP. Now R3 is redistributing EIGRP routes into OSPF. 
using a route map named rm underscore eigrp and then little arrow ospf. Let's take a look at that. Show route map rm eigrp and then a dash greater than sign ospf. And we've got one permit sequence matching a prefix list named pl underscore eigrp. All right, let's take a look at that. Show IPv6 prefix list. And the prefix list denies all IPv6 addresses. So that's obviously going to be a problem here. For this one, let's go ahead and add a permit sequence before this deny sequence to allow just the 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix. Configure terminal, IPv6 prefix list, PLEIGRP sequence for permit 8 double colon 8 slash 128, and again, sequence 4 because we want that to come before the deny sequence. All right, we'll do a show IPv6 OSPF dat external once again. All right, and now the prefix is in the link state database on R3, which means it should be in the link state database on R0 as well. Let's jump back over to R0. Show IPv6 route, 8 double colon 8. And there it is in the IPv6 routing table, and it's being learned from OSPF. So we know it's in the link state database. Let's go ahead and try to ping it. Ping 8 double colon 8. And all right, that works. Now, do we need to do anything with R4? Remember that it was the other ASBR. Well, the ticket said to ensure R0 can reach R8's loopback, and we've done that. So while we could go and make sure R4 is redistributing the prefix also, it's not necessary here. We've met the requirements of the ticket, and so we can consider this one solved. Two more to go. Ticket 9. Let's see what Ticket 9 has in store for us. Traffic sourced from R8's 8 double colon 8 slash 128 address to R0's 11 double colon 11 address is not passing through both R6 and R7. All right, this is starting to get a little bit complicated. Ensure R6 and R7 load share this traffic. Ensure R5 is not in the routing path. Okay, well, this is a lot more complex sounding than the other tickets. Let's please take a look at the layer 3 diagram. Now the ticket says that traffic from R8's 8 double colon 8 slash 128 loopback going to R0's loopback is not passing through both R6 and R7. Our mission is to ensure R6 and R7 load share this traffic and that R5 is not in the routing path. Okay, so let's go ahead and just jump on over to R8. Let's see if R8 has a route over to that 11 double colon 11 prefix. Show IPv6 route 11 double colon 11. And there is only one path and it is via R6. Okay, let's check the topology table. Show IPv6 EIGRP topology 11 double colon 11 slash 128. And here we actually have two paths and of course R6 has the lower feasible distance of 3328. So it is the successor. Now to get R8 to load share between R6 and R7, we have two options. We can either just tweak R7's feasible distance to make it equal to R6's feasible distance, which is 3328, and that will give us equal cost load sharing. The other option is to leave the feasible distances alone and to do unequal cost load sharing. Now, what is the better choice here? Well, in order to do unequal cost load sharing, then R7's reported distance, which is 3328, must be less than R6's feasible distance, which is also 3328. Remember, this is called the feasibility condition. Now, if R7's reported distance is not less than R6's feasible distance, then we could form a routing loop. In this case, R7's reported distance and R6's feasible distance are equal, so this does not meet the feasibility condition. And because of that, we cannot do unequal cost load sharing very easily. So 
Whichever option we choose, we're going to have to adjust some metrics. It makes sense then to just do equal cost load sharing by making R7s and R6s feasible distances equal. Okay, that's a simple concept, but how do we do it? Well, think about why these metrics are different. The delay for R6 is 30 microseconds. The delay for R7 is 40 microseconds. So what we can do is we can just raise the delay on the link facing R6, which if I scroll up a little bit here, that is actually gig 01. All right, let's go ahead and check the current interface delay for gig 01. Show interface gig 01. We'll include DLY. And the delay is 10 microseconds. So let's go ahead and just raise it up to 20. Configure terminal, interface gig 01, delay 2. Now, remember that this parameter is in tens of microseconds. So 2 is actually 20 microseconds. Hit enter here, and then let's go ahead and do a show IPv6 EIGRP topology 11, double colon 11 slash 128. And now, happily, both have an equal feasible distance. Okay, so let's check the IPv6 routing table. Do show IPv6 route 11, double colon 11. And there we go, two equal cost paths via R6 and R7. But before we get too excited, we need to make sure traffic does not pass through R5. To do that, we're going to run a trace route. Now our trace route options are a little bit limited here. If I hit question mark, I've got IPv6, but you'll see I don't have options for source, number of probes, and so on. So I'm just going to do trace route, protocol is IPv6, target 11 double colon 11, source 8 double colon 8, and I want to go to the probe count, probe count of 2, and then we'll leave all the other options default. Now what we have here, traffic passes through R6 or R7, and then R3 or R6, and then R1 before getting to R0. Now let's take a look at the layer 3 topology diagram. Again, traffic passes through R6 or R7, R3 or R6, R1, and then R0. Does this look like a load sharing? No, it actually appears that R7 just forwards the traffic to R6. Well, that's not very good load sharing. Now, why is this happening? Well, notice what's missing from the trace route. R4. We need to ensure that, at the very least, R4 gets into this path so that R7 can forward traffic to R4. We may have to involve R2 as well, but that remains to be seen. So this problem, which actually seemed... Well, it seemed kind of complicated at first, and then once we started working on it, it seemed to get a little bit easier. Well, it just potentially got a lot more complicated. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to R4. From here, we'll do a show IPv6 route 11, double colon 11. R4 has a next hop of R1, and it says it's redistributing this route via EIGRP. But let's see if this is actually the case. Show IPv6 EIGRP topology 11, double colon 11 slash 128, and R4 is redistributing the route via R1 into EIGRP, but it's redistributing it with a pretty high metric, 25,856. Now, if we look down a bit and compare, you can see the metric of the route via R5 is much lower. The ticket said that R5 cannot be anywhere in the routing path. Now, R4's constrained bandwidth via R1 is 100,000 kilobits, while via R5 it's 1 million kilobits. That's a pretty big difference. Let's go ahead and check how redistribution is configured here. Show IPv6 protocols, section EIGRP. And we are using a route map named RM underscore OSPF and then an arrow EIGRP. So OSPF into EIGRP. Let's take a look at that. Show route map. RM OSPF EIGRP. Anything that matches the prefix list, PL underscore OSPF, will get redistributed with a bandwidth of 100,000 kilobits. Okay, so what we need to do here is adjust the route map to increase the bandwidth to 1 million. We'll go ahead and configure terminal, route map RM underscore OSPF EIGRP. Set metric 1 million, six zeros there, and then we'll leave everything else as it is. 
Now, let's go ahead and do a show IPv6 EIGRP topology 11 double colon 11 slash 128. And now we have one route via R1. So once traffic hits R4, it will go to R1. But we still need to make sure that return traffic from R0 does not pass through R5. So let's check how R4 gets to the 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix. Do show IPv6 route 8 double colon 8. Uh-huh, it's via R5. Now let's look at the diagram again. This just doesn't look right. The shortest path from R4 to R8 is via R7. And we know that from the earlier trace route that R7 is not using R4 as its next hop to get to R0. So it's starting to look like R4 and R7 are not exchanging routes at all. Well, perhaps they don't have an adjacency. Let's go ahead and check. Do show IPv6 EIGRP neighbor. And indeed, R4 has one adjacency with R5, but not with R7. Now in the interest of time, let's do an EIGRP packet debug to see if we can spot any problems with this adjacency. Do debug EIGRP packet. And then we'll go ahead and turn off the debugs here. Notice we have this message, gig07 ignored packet from FE80 double colon 7, authentication off or keychain missing. Well, that's R7. It looks like R7 has authentication enabled and R4 doesn't. All right, let's go ahead and check the interface facing R7. Do show run interface gig 07. We've got an IPv6 authentication command that specifies a keychain, KC underscore EIGRP. But what's missing here? This command doesn't actually enable authentication. It just specifies the keychain. To enable authentication, we need a different command. We'll go ahead and do interface gig07, IPv6 authentication mode, and you'll see we have only one option, EIGRP, the AS number 1337, and we have only one option, MD5. All right, that's the command to enable MD5 authentication. And as you can see, as soon as we issue that command, the adjacency comes up. Now, let's go ahead and check the route to 8, double colon 8 again. Do show IPv6 route, 8 double colon 8, and it's via R7. This is perfect. All right, great. Let's jump back to R8 and run that trace route again. We'll do a trace route, IPv6, not IPv7, that doesn't exist yet, as far as I know. 11 double colon 11 is the target, 8 double colon 8 is the source. And we'll go ahead and leave the probe count at 3. And now traffic passes to R7, then R4, then R1, and then finally R0. Well, that's not load shared at all. That's terrible. All right, what's going on here? Let's take a look at the topology table. Show IPv6 EIGRP topology 11 double colon 11 slash 128. The route via R7 now has a lower metric and it doesn't take long to see why it has a lower delay 30 microseconds as opposed to r6's 40 microseconds and this makes sense because this is a cumulative delay when we opened up that route between r4 and r7 r7's cumulative delay decreased it went down so to make r7's and r6's metrics equal we just need to adjust the interface delay again on the interface facing r7 which is gig02. Show int gig02 and include DLY. All right, it is 10 microseconds. So we'll do int gig02, delay of two. We just wanna go ahead and raise it by 10 microseconds. And now do show IPv6 EIGRP topology, 11 double colon 11 slash 128. And now R6 and R7 have equal feasible distances. All right, let's go ahead and try that trace route again. Trace route, IPv6, 11 double colon 11, 8 double colon 8, and we'll go ahead and leave all the defaults. All right, this is looking good. Now traffic passes via R6 or R7, of course, then R3 or R4, and then finally R1. So we've got load sharing occurring, 
R5 does not show up in the routing path at all. So after a little bit of work, this ticket is solved. Ticket 10, let's knock it out. Ensure load sharing occurs whenever possible with traffic from R0 to 8 double colon 8 slash 128. Do not remove any routing adjacencies. Okay, this sounds kind of like the last ticket. Let's take a look at R0. So we need to ensure that load sharing occurs whenever we basically ping 8 double colon 8 slash 128 from R0. So let's do a show IPv6 route 8 double colon 8. And it has only one route via R1, but not via R2. All right, let's check the link state database here. Show IPv6 OSPF dat external. We've got only one type 5 LSA, and that is from R3. Now, if you look at the layer 3 diagram, both R3 and R4 are ASBRs. And to get load sharing, both will need to generate type 5 external LSAs for the 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix. That does not seem to be happening. And that is a problem, but that still doesn't address the question of why we don't have a path via R2. Every router in the OSPF topology should have the type 5 LSA, including R2, and yet R2 doesn't seem to be flooding that LSA to R0. Let's see what we are getting from R2. Show IPv6 OSPF dat advertising router 2222. And we are learning some LSAs from R2, but it's not that many. All right, do you see anything strange here? Well, first of all, the only LSAs that we have are in area 0, which is strange because the link between R0 and R2 should be in area 112 if you look at the diagram. But do you see anything else? Each LSA indicates DNA in parentheses, which means do not age. Let's take a look at one of these. Show IPv6 OSPF dat prefix advertising router 2222. Let's go down to this 23 prefix here. And there is the do not age bit. And again, this LSA is from area zero. This actually describes the prefix between R2 and R3. So what's going on here? If you look at the layer three diagram, R0 doesn't even have any interfaces in area zero. So how is it getting these LSAs? Well, there is one thing that would explain all of this, a virtual link. Let's see if we have a virtual link here. Show IPv6 OSPF virtual links. And indeed, we have a virtual link to R1, and it even says here, do not age LSA allowed. So what's happening is that R0 is learning those LSAs not directly from R2, but from R1. Now, this is a huge clue because it means R0 and R2 have a problem with their adjacency. Let's go ahead and check that. Show IPv6 OSPF neighbor, and sure enough, no adjacency. Now, I know what you're thinking. Couldn't we have just checked the adjacencies first? And of course we could have, but that still wouldn't tell us why the adjacency is broken. We now know that R2 is flooding LSAs into area zero, so that means OSPF is configured on R2 and it is functioning at least to some degree. So let's jump over to R2 now. Let's see what LSAs R2 is generating. Show IPv6 OSPF dat advertising router 2222. And this looks familiar. We've got area zero LSAs. Let's scroll down, and now we have area 112 LSAs. Okay, what do you notice here? Is there anything missing? Look at the inter-area prefixes. Area 112 is a normal area. So what LSAs would you expect to see for inter-area prefixes? Well, I mean, you'd expect to see a lot, right? I mean, we've got all sorts of prefixes in area 0. 13, 14, 23, 24, and so on. Now look at the link state database. R2 has only one inter area prefix and it's the default route. What could cause that? Well, if R2 has area 112 defined as a totally stubby or totally NSSA area, then it will not flood any inter area prefix LSAs into the area except for a single default route. So we can conclude that R2 has area 112 configured as either a total stub or a totally NSSA. Let's go ahead and check, show run, include area 112. 
And sure enough, it has Area 112, NSSA, no summary, which defines a totally NSSA or a totally not so stubby area, as it's called. Well, this is an easy fix. We'll simply remove this command. Configure terminal, IPv6 router OSP of 1, no area 112 NSSA. And by the way, if you do a no area 112 NSSA no dash summary, it will only remove the no dash summary keyword. It will still leave this as an NSSA. All right, the adjacency with R0 just came up. So next, we need to make sure R4 generates an external LSA for the 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix. Let's check the LSA coming from R3. So IPv6 OSPF dat external. And there it is, a type E2 OSPF route. Okay, let's jump over to R4 now. Let's do a show IPv6 route 8 double colon 8. And it's learning this via EIGRP, but it doesn't say that it's redistributing into OSPF. Let's do a show IPv6 OSPF. And it says redistributing external routes from EIGRP AS1337 as type E1 routes using a route map name RM underscore EIGRP dash greater than OSPF. All right, well, let's look at that. Let's do a show route map RM EIGRP OSPF. And any prefix in the PL underscore EIGRP list will get redistributed. Let's see what is there. Do show IPv6 prefix PL EIGRP. And of course, all routes are denied here. Well, again, this is an easy fix. We'll just go ahead and add that prefix before sequence five. IPv6 prefix list PL EIGRP sequence four permit eight double colon eight slash 128. Okay, so now that we have that in place, let's jump back to R0. We'll do a show IPv6 OSPF dat external. And yes, there is our second external LSA, this one from R4. Now let's check the routing table. Show IPv6 route eight double colon eight. And we still have only one path via R1. So what is going on here? Well, one thing that happened, and it's subtle, is that the metric type is different. This is a type E1 route, while the one coming from R3 is a type E2 route. OSPF prefers type E1 routes over type E2. So we need to make sure that these routes are the same metric type. Let's jump back over to R4 again. Now the goal here is to have R4 redistribute the 8 double colon 8 slash 128 prefix into OSPF as a type E2 metric. Let's go ahead and look at that route map again. Notice that in the set clauses we have metric dash type type 1. Let's go ahead and change that. We'll do route map RMEIGRP OSPF set metric type type 2. And now we'll do a show IPv6 OSPF dat external advertising router 4444, which is R4. And this route from R4 is now a type E2. Okay, so this looks good. Let's jump back to R0 again. A lot of jumping back and forth. Show IPv6 route 8 double colon 8. And it's still via R1, but Notice the metric type has changed. It's now an E2. It was an E1. All right, let's do a show IPv6 OSPF dat external. And we do have two external LSAs from R3 and R4. And let's check and see what other LSAs we're learning from R2. Show IPv6 OSPF dat advertising router 2222. Two, two, two. And indeed, we are learning quite a few from R2. So that's not the problem. But look at the inter area prefixes for area 0. We've got 10 double colon slash 64 and 20 double colon slash 64. Do you recognize those? Look at the layer 3 diagram. They're the links between R0 and R1 and R0 and R2. And we know that those are in area 112. Now, all things being equal, R0 should load share between R1 and R2 to get to the 8 double colon 8 prefix. But there's something that's not in this diagram. 
there is another link between R0 and R1. And we've actually already seen it. It's that virtual link we saw a little bit earlier. And do you remember what area that's in? Area 0. So R0 will always route via R1 because the LSAs it's learning via that virtual link are Area 0 LSAs, and those are better than the LSAs learned via Area 112. All right, did I lose you there? Let's jump back to R0 to get a clearer picture of this. Let's do a show IPv6 OSPF interface brief. Here we go. Now this should hopefully clear things up. The virtual link is in Area 0, while Gig01 and Gig02, facing R1 and R2 respectively, are in area 112. Remember that OSPF always tries to route within an area. Now this makes it abundantly clear why R0 always prefers R1 because R0's virtual link to R1 is in area 0. So now that we understand why we're not getting load sharing, how do we solve this? Well, we cannot remove the virtual link. The ticket constrains us there. And even if we could, it's probably not a good idea because chances are it was put there for a reason. Instead, let's just add another virtual link, this time between R0 and R2. To do that, configure terminal, IPv6 router OSPF1. The transit area is going to be 112, virtual link 2222. And of course, we need to add the corresponding virtual link on R2. So let's jump to R2 now. IPv6 router OSPF1, Area 112 virtual link 11, 11, 11, 11. And the link comes up. Super. Now, let's go ahead and jump back to R0 again. All right, cross your fingers. The moment of truth has arrived. Show IPv6 route 8, double colon 8. And yes, we have two paths between R1 and R2. Super. Let's do a trace route here. Trace 8, double colon 8. And, ah, oh, this is fantastic. We go from R0 to R1 or R2, then R3 or R4, R6 or R7, and then finally R8. So we have load sharing happening all the way along the path. So finally, after a little bit of time and effort, this ticket is solved.